Okay. I'm pretty fatigued. Yeah, no. I need to sleep. Okay. Hungry. We're not very hungry, but I do a kitchen today. I did it twice, and I didn't get a lot of hunger. What's the fatigue icon? Yeah, oh yeah, that one. So I think we'll go through week 30 and then call it a night. Okay. Hmm. Now what? I'm wondering if I should do that, but no. You really don't like pride. I'm not going for pride. I'm trying to distribute the points. Right. And Everything has you a have, chance of you pride. You have pride as the least. Everything has a chance of pride. But you need pride. If, right, but if, if if pride came up, you wouldn't be able to spend anything. Only one of the activities has two pride available. All the other ones have just one. Okay. And if they have, has a chance. I'm just not getting. So basically, you're just going to do like you do with artistry. Is you're just going to max it and keep going forever. Well, I was trying to get more hunger and more uh, chill this time. Don't be so chill. Sarah Lavinia tells me that you've left the window in her room quite open all day long. Did I? I don't think that I did. But it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, Miss Minchin. It was an accident. Have you no thought for the weather? If it begins to rain, many of her belongings could be damaged, you stupid girl. You don't know that you were saying these things to a princess, and that if I chose, I could wave my hand and order you to execution. She's so happy about <laughs> ordering execution. Ooh. Emily has an influence upon her. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. I'd better go and check that all the other windows are closed properly. I only spare you because I'm a princess, and you are a poor, stupid, unkind, vulgar old thing, and you don't know any better. She's kind of creepy when she's talking harsh, and she's got that smile with a little, ooh. Please excuse me, cook. A princess must be polite. Sarah bobbed gently and walked out of the room. That girl, the smile as if she hadn't even been scolded. Sometimes I can't tell whether she hears me at all. It's as if she were living in another world. She's got more airs and graces than if she come from Buckingham Palace, that young one. She drops them about the kitchen as if it was nothing. It is not a natural way for a child who has lost her only parent to behave. She is a clever girl, and that is why she is useful, but it may also turn her sly. I won't have her plotting mischief. Keep her busy. If she is tired enough, she will have no time to put to ill purposes. Well, I am tired, lady, so don't you worry. See, I need that fatigue. Well, you already had that fatigue. The streets of London would never be perfectly clean, no matter how many brushes the street sweepers wielded. Rain could not wash the mud and refuse away. It only blended them together, helping them to spread their unappetizing clutches over the city's stones. And if the streets were never clean, then it stood to reason that an entrance hall was very, very rarely clean either. Today, it was Sarah's task to scrub away what had been tracked inside. If this dirt could talk, what stories might it have to tell? How many boots has it traveled under? Perhaps mud doesn't like being indoors. If it can make it all the way back to the fields and forests, then it can grow again with the grass and the trees. Oh, humble dirt, if I could, I would carry you to freedom. Okay, that's a little bit weird. <laughs> even for her. No, I think it's nice. It is, it's just a bit weird. You're weird. Sarah was jolted out of her pleasant daydreams by an all-too-familiar sound. Miss Minchin's voice raised in anger. But it was not Sarah that she was scolding. Her voice appeared to be coming from the nearby classroom. Wasn't Becky in there? She crept closer to listen. As well as stupid? Is it expecting too much from a clod to ask that you watch where you put your feet? Yes, Mum. I mean, no, Mum. Don't you get smart with me, you wretch! That cat is worth twice what you are! Was it Becky who stepped on Tibalt earlier? I did think I'd heard him screech. I'm sure she didn't mean to. Tibalt loves to curl up in the most inconvenient places. I'm always having to chase him off the stairs so no one trips over him. Unlike you lazy girls, Tibalt always gets his job done. What is his job, laying there? 
I don't know. You should ask her. He sleeps half the time. We work all day and into the night. I'm sorry, Mom. Uh, I'll be more careful. You had better be. There are dozens of girls in the workhouses who could fill your position in a heartbeat. Remember, Tibble holds a pedigree from the National Cat Club. Ho ho, Tibble, ho ho. In light of your carelessness, I am docking your wages for the week. If you do not improve, it will go worse with you. Wages? Her own servitude, of course, came without recompense. Miss Minchin had emphasized repeatedly that Sarah was in her debt. Anything she might earn was immediately deducted and applied to that balance. But Becky was an ordinary girl, hired from the workhouse by traditional channels. If Sarah had ever really considered the matter, it might have been obvious that she must receive some sort of wages. Money had never been of great interest to Sarah. First, she had so much that she never had to count the cost of anything, and then she had nothing at all, and all costs were equally out of reach. Becky's wages, though, created something of a mystery. If she was being paid, why did she seem as penniless as Sarah? See that you do! With a start, Sarah realized that Miss Minchin had concluded her tirade and was moving towards the door. She quickly hurried back to her work. Questions would have to wait for the safety of a dark attic. That evening, Sarah made her way up the stairs to the attic, checking carefully for any suspiciously furry lump that might attempt to block her path. Inside her room, she could not resist lying back on the hard mattress for just a few moments to take the weight off her feet. I mustn't sleep. Not yet. If I fall asleep now, I will forget. The eyes are back. My head feels so heavy. My arms are trembling from too much work. I daren't carry a candle like this. It would shake right out of my grasp. I must not sleep yet. Wearily, she struggled back to her feet and, strum and stumbled over to the wall that divided her half of the attic from Becky's. She knocked a careful pattern of four knocks, a message to her fellow prisoner. Come to me through the secret passage. I have something to communicate. Five quick knocks answered her. She is coming. Almost immediately, the door of the attic opened and Becky appeared. Is everything all right, miss? Oh, of course. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to worry you. I only wanted to talk. Actually, I wanted to ask you about something. Is it true that Miss Minchin pays you wages? Yes, miss. Well, when she wants to, and most of the time she don't. I never knew you had any money. Ain't not but a half shill in a week, miss. That's only if it's paid. Seems every other week the missus finds some reason I don't deserve it. Sixpence? To Miss Minchin that coin is nothing, nothing at all. And she takes it away, just to taunt Becky. But she does pay you sometimes, right? What do you do with it? Oh, well, used to be. I stayed up my wages to take to my mum, at the workhouse. She was still there, you see, and I, I thought it might help. Only, after I brung it to her, when I've gone back, I can't find her no more. She ain't there. Maybe she found a job. Could be, miss, or could be she took a ride out of the city looking for some other life, now that she knew I had a place and didn't need her. But, well, she were always fond of gin. Sarah shook her head. Every time I think that I understand the world and the people in it, I realize again how little I really know. It's all accidents and tragedies, all over. Good things happened to me by accident when I was born. And then sad things came later, but all those same sad things happened to you too, without even the good ones first. Becky lost her father and her mother both. She had to live in a workhouse. She never had teachers who were kind to her. It isn't right. Why can't she be happy? Why can't everyone be happy? Becky did not seem to notice Sarah's outrage. Some good things did happen to me, miss. I, I never had a friend like you before. Sparkly eyes are back. And I've liked having you tell me things, even if I'm not clever enough to remember one and read from the other. You are. You're just not used to it. It's not your fault England had a lot of kings named Henry. If you say so, miss. We must have another lesson. But not tonight. I'm already too tired, because I have all this fatigue, because someone keeps getting me fatigued. Is it Emily? <laughs> no. Still, the thought would not leave her. If you don't take away your wages to the workhouse anymore, what do you do with them? Do you buy yourself food, or save for new shoes? It was a pleasant thought to imagine poor downtrodden Becky sneaking away to buy a ticket for the music hall and an evening's light entertainment. But when would she find the time? Oh, 
no, I couldn't. I don't. If I bought a pie and ate it, then the next day, I wouldn't have no pie or no coin. I maybe could buy shoes or a blanket someday if I saved enough, but I don't know what I need the most. And if I spent all my coin, then I wouldn't have it if I needed something else more. And, and what if something bad happened, miss? What if you got sick and needed a doctor? Miss Minchin wouldn't pay. You ought to be worrying more about yourself than me, but I suppose it's very wise of you to save your money. Becky shook her head. I know what I'm worth, miss, and I know what I'm not good enough. I can't make decisions. I can't. That's why I can't spend nothing. I don't know what's right to do, and I don't want to be wrong. Suddenly, she clasped at Sarah's hand. You're the clever one, miss. You'll know what to do. You'll make the sign when the time's right, won't you? I... I'll try. Becky let out a sigh of relief. I'll bring you my tin to keep it safe. Truth be told, I'll sleep better with you having it. Sarah's eyes sparkled. It will be like our buried treasure. And so, Becky's battered little tin with its sparse sprinkling of small change was fetched and remarked upon as if it were a coffer of rubies, then buried under Sarah's bed. And Emily shall keep watch. <laughs> <laughs> and the money was gone. Or more money is added. Who's she stealing from? One afternoon, there came a familiar tapping at Sarah's door. She knew by the sound that it was Becky. But Becky was too excited to wait for a response and burst into the room only moments after knocking. Can we see it from your window? See what? There's a van and horses and men with furniture. You thought it was coming. Do you mean the house next door? Together, they scrambled up onto Sarah's thin mattress and craned their heads to see the road outside. Sarah could just make out men in shirt sleeves carrying heavy packages and furniture, though she could not see the interest that they walked through. Still, there was only one house she knew to be vacant so close. It's taken. It really is taken. Oh, I do hope a nice head will look out the attic window. <laughs> That's so weird. Like, it's not so nice. Wish we could go down and see up close, but Cook would have our backs for idling. Oh, Becky, look! Glimpsed for a moment were items that made Sarah's heart give a quick beat of recognition. There was a beautiful table of elaborately wrought teak wood and some chairs and a screen covered with rich oriental embroidery. They look so much like the things I used to see when I lived in India with my papa. Do you remember my carved teak wood desk, Becky? Miss Minchin took it away to be sold. Don't know what's teak wood, miss, but I know you had a pretty desk. Sometimes it's hard to remember from here what it was like in India. It is like a dream slipping from my fingers. Look now, there are patterned rugs. I thought I might never see such things again. Miss, an idol. The workers now had a Buddha in a splendid shrine. Someone in the family must have been in India. They have got used to Indian things and like having them around. I am glad. I shall feel as if they were friends, even if a head never looks out of the attic window. Becky's mind was still caught by the sight of the Buddha. And he didn't live next door, kneeling down and praying to Golden Stone. Reckon someone ought to send him a track? You can get a track for a penny. Sarah laughed a little. Huh? I don't believe they worship that idol. Some people like to keep them to look at, because they are interesting. My papa had a beautiful one, and he did not worship it. More romantic with Ethan's, don't you think, miss? I never lived next door to no Ethan's. I should like to see what sort of ways they had have. People aren't so different, really, when you look at them closely enough. I'm sure we'll find out more about our new neighbors soon. They're only next door, after all. Alright, then we'll go through this week and that'll be it. Okay. Alright. Alright, I'm gonna try to up my pride, because... You never know. And it could be good, because all the cold turns into... Fatigue, well, I'm not going to gain any cold, so that's a beneficial thing. The last one gets me too pride, and then it's just the double fatigue, double... What is that? Sorrow? Yeah, that's Which sorrow. I need sorrow anyways, so that... I think that's a good choice. Okay. But if you get the first one, you get nothing. Well, that's... These are... Well, yeah. Well, ho! Who's got pride now? What? I feel like I'm cheating. Six pride. You're pretty arrogant. Oh, come on. You knew I was worried about that. That's just cold to say that. <laughs> now you'll just never be friends with Becky. She's beneath you oh, at this point. Oh, 
No, she's not. Sarah was in the schoolroom with her small pupils. Well, they are pretty blank at these times. Having finished giving them their lessons, she was now gathering the French exercise books together. Really? What? Her eyes keep going vacant. Yeah, I know. As she did so, she thought, as she often did, about the various things that royal personages in disguise had found themselves forced to do. Alfred the Great, for example, had wandered to England like a peasant to hide from the invading Danes, begging for food in exchange for chores. Gotta watch out for those dogs. They're pretty great, but they can... Yeah, that's all I got. Once he had been promised cakes by a farm wife if he would watch the stove while she herded the cows, but he was distracted thinking about his problems, and the cakes burned, and the farm wife boxed his ears. She had no idea that he was anything but a poor beggar. How frightened she must have been when she learned what she had done. Sarah saw Miss Minchin enter the room to check on the progress of the older students. She lowered her gaze and smiled to herself. Imagine if she should find out that I, Sarah, with my toes almost sticking out of my worn old shoes, am truly a princess. She did not realize how this expression might look to the older woman, like a sly little smirk. You! All at once, Miss Minchin flew at Sarah, pinching her ear and giving it a shake. It was so very like the way that Alfred's ears had been boxed that Sarah, startled out of her dreams, could not help but give a little laugh. It was not planned, but simply burst out of her. What are you laughing at, you bold, impudent child? It took Sarah a few seconds to control herself sufficiently to remember that she was a princess. I was thinking. Beg my pardon at once. Sarah hesitated a second before she replied. I will beg your pardon for laughing, if it was rude, but I won't beg your pardon for thinking. What were you thinking? How dare you think? That exclamation caused a wave of quiet titters among the older students. Look at Sarah, she's not even frightened. She's about to say something queer, I'm sure of it. I was thinking that you did not know what you were doing. That I did not know what I was doing? I was thinking about what would happen if I were a princess. What I should do to you. And I was thinking that if I were one, you would never dare to do it, whatever I said or did. I was thinking how surprised and frightened you would be if you suddenly found out that I really was a princess and could do anything, anything I liked. Every pair of eyes in the room widened to its full limit. Lavinia leaned forward on her seat to look. Miss Minchin's hand flashed and Sarah's cheek glowed red. Go to your room this instant! Leave this schoolroom! And you, young ladies, attend to your lessons! Sarah made a little bow. Excuse me for laughing, if it was impolite. And she walked out of the room, leaving Miss Minchin struggling for words. Did you see that? How very odd she looked! Her eyes were glittering like a wild beast! I shouldn't be at all surprised if she did turn out to be something. Suppose she should. Oh, she needs pride. Oh. What? Why are you were you kind of pointing me that way on purpose? Or were you just kind of point out because it really was low? It was really ridiculously low. And it was silly that you kept leaving it low. Yeah. The game that is pretty much dictated by if you have the resources for that event. And right. you don't have any auxiliary choices. Although right. you could skip a weekend. I'll yeah. only tell you the ramifications of such at the end of this all. I don't intend to skip weekend unless I have no choice. Okay. That Saturday afternoon, Sarah was assisting little Lottie with her schoolwork revisions. You must say your times tables over and over again every day, Lottie. It's very important. But they're boring. You must memorize them until you know them so well that you don't even have to think about the answers. They should always seem obvious, as if they were already written in front of you. You will need that in order to do more maths later. I don't want to do more math, Sarah Mama. Well, you don't want maths to be your mystical weakness, do you? Imagine someone asks you what is 3 times 12, and you're so confused that your brain seizes. And you're frozen in place and you miss something because you can't find the answer. Three times twelve? I don't have to memorize three times twelve, do I? Miss Minchin didn't say anything about twelve. Not yet. Now let me hear what you've been practicing. Lottie furrowed her brow and pursed her lips, but it seemed there was no escaping it. Three times one is three. 
Three times two is six. Three times three is nine. As Sarah coached Lottie through the simple mathematics drill, Becky came into the room on her cleaning rounds. She paused for a moment, listening to that shrill, childish voice reciting number after number, a look of confusion on her face. I really ought to give Becky help with maths, too. If only we had more free time. Thirty-three. There. Now can we do something else? You never tell me stories anymore, Sarah Mama. I'm sorry, I'm only allowed to tell you about things that you are learning in your classes. Lottie's cheeks puffed out in disapproval. Before she could begin to wail and fuss, Sarah redirected the conversations. History is kind of a story. Have you been paying attention to your histories? What can you tell me about Henry the Seventh? Lottie gulped, thrown off her sulk. Um, he became king when he was a baby and then got locked in a tower? Weren't that Henry the Sixth? She clapped her hands over her mouth in dismay at interrupting. Don't be shy, Pecky. Come and sit with us. You are studying, too. She is? Everyone needs to know history. Come on, Becky. Let's see what you can remember. Tell us about Henry the Seventh. Well, we're all part of the War of the Roses, I think. Both of them were, but the Sixth started it and the Seventh ended it. Not sure who was in between except the weren't Henry. That's right. Henry the Seventh won his crown by winning the war. Why was it called the War of the Roses? Lottie's turn. Um, they were red and white roses to show which side they were on? They sat together in the long classroom benches, their heads occasionally bowing close to murmur some of the more interesting tidbits of ancient gossip, and giggle as school children often do. It might have been this sight that provoked Lavinia when she entered the room. What is going on here? Oh. oh! You filthy things! Hovering over a young lady like Lottie, you'll give her diseases! Ew! Hush, there's nothing wrong. Why are you sitting down? Are you shirking? Miss Minchin wouldn't like to hear that. Uh, I'm sorry, miss. Don't move! She stood up, folded her arms, and glared at Lavinia in her best impression of a stern teacher. We're having weekend classes. Helping students with their schoolwork is one of my responsibilities, Miss Herbert. Miss Minchin would like to hear that you were interfering. Oh, if you're helping students, then what is that creature doing here? Becky is just as much a student as any of the rest of us. She's helping me remember my kings. <laughs> I don't know why this sounds goofy. Helping, is she? Helping you right into horrible habits and dropped ages. Uh, what? Like oh. when she says, I add, you okay. know. Helping, is she? Helping you right into horrible habits and dropped ages, I expect. She turned her glare back full force onto Becky. Get up and get away from that young lady right this instant. Yes, miss. Becky, don't. I have to go, miss. I'm sorry. She hurried out of the room, not looking back. That's better. At least the air in here won't smell quite so much. You must always be on your guard around people like that, Lottie. Check your pockets carefully. That one's a thief. She might have stolen your pennies. Lottie's eyes went wide and she patted her skirt nervously. Becky is not a thief. Breeding will tell. The dregs of society stay that way for a reason. You ought to know. You're the only dreg that I see here. At least Becky is trying to learn and improve herself. We shall see. Lifting her nose, she flounced out of the room. It was Sarah, not Becky, who first caught sight of the man who had purchased the house next door. The day was wet with the unpleasant aftermath of the wrong amount of rain, enough to turn dirt to mud and trash to sludge, but not enough to wash the street stones clean. Sarah had to be careful to mind her steps or else she might wind up falling into filth. As she picked her way back to the cemetery, she saw a carriage pull up and stop before the newly occupied house. One at a time, the entourage unfurled. First, a footman, 
and then a gentleman whom Sarah thought she had seen around London before. Next, a nurse in uniform, and then two large manservants coming around to assist their master. Not the familiar gentleman, but a man with a haggard, distressed face and a skeletal body wrapped in furs. He was carried up the steps, and the other gentleman followed behind him, looking anxious. Sarah could not safely linger any longer to watch. The last thing she saw before heading back into Miss Minchin's seminary was the arrival of a doctor's carriage. Inside, Becky caught her to share the gossip. I heard the gentleman next door is yellow, miss. Could he be a Chinese and not from India? No, he's not Chinese. He's very ill. I hope it ends better for him than it did for my papa. Oh, miss. Please, I would rather be alone right now. Yes, miss. But I would not rather be alone. I would rather that my papa were here. Or even if I were back in my old rooms and Mariette were there. She picked up Emily and ran a hand over the doll's hair. You are all that I have. She set the doll back on a chair and perched her own thin form on the red footstool, gazing into Emily's glassy eyes. One of Sarah's supposings was that Emily might be a kind of good witch who could protect her. Sometime, after she had stared at her until she was wrought up to the highest pitch of fancifulness, she would ask her questions and find herself almost believing that Emily might answer. But Emily never did. Thank goodness. Well, I don't answer people who speak to me very often, either. I never answer when I can help it. When people are insulting you, there's nothing so good as not to say a word, just to look at them and think. Miss Minton turns pale with rage when I do it, and the girls look frightened. When you will not fly into a passion, people know that you are stronger than they are, and they say stupid things they wish they hadn't said afterward. It's a good thing not to answer your enemies. Perhaps Emily is more like me than I am like myself. Perhaps she would rather not answer her friends either. She keeps it all in her heart. But though she tried to satisfy herself with these arguments, she did not find it easy. All right, we're going to go and call it a night for here. Thank you very much for watching Trans play a little Lily Princess. I'm still a princess, just on the inside. That's all you're worth. And thank you very much for watching Trans play a little Lily Princess. We'll see you next time. See ya.